This is part three of the lecture on imaging of the salivary glands. On to the malignancies. Mucoepidermoid carcinoma. This common malignancy comes in two different types, high grade and low grade. The prognosis of the tumor is closely related to the grade of tumor. Five-year survival is 90% for low-grade tumors versus a mere 30% for high-grade tumors. These two different types of mucoepidermoid carcinoma also have different radiologic appearances. The high-grade tumors tend to be infiltrative with poorly defined borders, whereas the low-grade tumors tend to be well circumscribed. The risk of metastatic disease from mucoepidermoid carcinoma is high, such that even in the absence of radiologic findings, patients undergo neck dissections to look for occult metastatic disease. Mucoepidermoid carcinoma can calcify, although it's not typical, and it can undergo cystic degeneration, although again, not typical. The tumor is of low T1 signal and has variable T2 signal. The higher the grade of the tumor, the lower the T2 signal. And that theme runs through all of the malignancies that we encounter in the salivary glands. Here's an example of a low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma. The border is well circumscribed, it's uniformly enhancing, it's a well-defined tumor. There is nothing about this tumor that would allow you to distinguish it from a pleomorphic adenoma on radiology. Here's another example of a low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma, this time on MRI. In the coronal plane, you can see a well-defined tumor, some heterogeneity and enhancement, but overall uh, well-defined and benign-looking. That is a malignancy. Here is a high-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma. As promised, the margins are extremely ill-defined. It's infiltrating into the surrounding soft tissues. Uh, it looks like it's spread through that stylomandibular tunnel, which is why that's not a perfectly specific finding for pleomorphic adenoma, but very aggressive. Uh, this would certainly not be mistaken for benign disease, given how ill-defined and infiltrative the border is. The other major malignancy that we encounter in the salivary glands is adenoid cystic carcinoma. Adenoid cystic carcinoma is famed for perineural invasion, although it's not the only tumor that will do so. It's also famed for being essentially incurable. Although we can get local regional control of adenoid cystic carcinoma, it invariably recurs usually as lung metastases, often described as cannonball metastases. Now, the good news is that there can be a prolonged remission of adenoid cystic carcinoma. And by prolonged, I mean decades. If you go in breast cancer, for example, with 10 years of no disease, you're presumed to, to be cured. But that is not true of adenoid cystic carcinoma. 10 years, you've still got the disease, and it is still almost certain to recur. But the rem remission can be 10, 20, 30 years before recurrence, usually as lung metastases. Here's an example of adenoid cystic carcinoma, a very infiltrative, angry-looking mass, very poorly defined border. You can see a vein that has been encased by the tumor. And interestingly, you can also see some spread medially along this nerve right here. This is a very important nerve anatomically. It's the auriculotemporal nerve, which is a branch of the fifth cranial nerve. And lesions that arise within the parotid gland, although they usually travel up along the facial nerve if they're going to do perineural spread, will sometimes instead choose the auriculotemporal nerve and crawl up along the fifth cranial nerve. This is an alternate means of intracranial spread of parotid tumors. So it's very important to look for that when you're evaluating tumors, especially those prone to perineural spread. Here's an example of that perineural spread. You can see the tumor along V3 coming through foramen ovale and up here into Meckel's cave, which is expanded with nodular enhancement. And you can see it's also from there spread into the cavernous sinus over here.
Here's another example of perineural spread, this time along V2. Here we are running through foramen rotundum back into Meckel's cave, and you can see that there's abnormal enhancement right where you'd expect the Gasserian ganglion. Uh, the normal configuration of Meckel's cave has been distorted by that anterior tumor spread. Here is a more classic form of tumor spread from a parotid adenoid cystic carcinoma. You can see that the stylomastoid foramen is completely filled with tumor, and as you look more superiorly, there's abnormal enhancement of the vertical segment of the facial nerve. This is the classic form of perineural spread for a parotid tumor. Again, adenoid cystic carcinoma. One more example of perineural spread here along the third cranial nerve. You can see all the branches of the third cranial nerve coming together here and into the cavernous sinus, uh, just uh, uh, the way we'd expect that uh, nerve to spread. This is actually a lacrimal adenoid cystic carcinoma. Um, and as we discussed earlier, the lacrimal gland is really just a modified salivary gland. So not surprising to find adenoid cystic carcinoma uh, in that location. This is an example of the cannonball metastases that are classic for recurrent adenoid cystic carcinoma. Sometimes these appear soon after the diagnosis is made. Um, sometimes these appear only after decades of remission. This is truly a capricious tumor. Every mass that arises within the salivary glands is of salivary origin. There are non-salivary tumors that commonly arise within the salivary glands. Lipomas are relatively frequent. Vascular malformations, sometimes called hemangiomas, are frequent. Lymphoma can affect the parotid gland. Remember that the parotid gland is the only one with lymph nodes, so that is unique to the parotid gland. And metastatic disease can also affect the parotid gland. Typically, this is squamous cell carcinoma from the scalp or face that is spreading down to the parotid nodes, but occasionally nodes from random locations such as pelvic primaries can result in parotid lesions. Here's an example of a typical lipoma arising within the superficial lobe of the parotid gland. The diagnosis is, of course, made by the bland fatty characteristics of the tumor. It is common to have a lipoma in case vascular structures. Finding that vein in the center of it is no big deal. Um, this is a typical benign lipoma, and it is only of interest if it is a problem cosmetically. Here is a mass within the superficial lobe of the parotid gland that is enhancing extremely briskly. It is comparable to the arterial structures on this image, and that's what lets us know that this is probably a vascular malformation. This is what hemangiomas look like in the parotid gland. This is an example of a primary parotid lymphoma. There's not much here that allows us to be specific about this diagnosis. There are multiple lesions, um, and that might help us to include lymphoma on the differential, but there's nothing specific in this case. Here's another benign mass of the parotid gland, and I offer this up because there's very little that about this mass that would allow you to distinguish any of the things that we talked about. This could be a pleomorphic adenoma. It could be a low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma. It turns out that this is another benign lesion of the parotid gland, an oncocytoma, but there's nothing about this image that's going to let you make that specific diagnosis. This brings us to our summary of salivary tumors. When you are confronted with a salivary mass, it is useful to divide your differential diagnosis into solitary masses, multifocal masses, and thus distinguish between the different lesions. A solitary mass is either going to be benign or malignant, and if it is benign, which is most common in the parotid gland, then it's most likely to be a pleomorphic adenoma.
If it is malignant, which is more common in the smaller glands, then it's likely to be mucoepidermoid carcinoma or adenoid cystic carcinoma. Although mucoepidermoid carcinoma is most common in the parotid gland, adenoid cystic carcinoma is slightly more frequent in the smaller glands. If you are confronted with multifocal masses, consider a Worthen's tumor, particularly if it is in an elderly male who smokes, which is the classic demographic. But also consider lymphoma, either primary or secondary, and metastatic disease, as from scalp primaries. The bottom line, though, is that it is very difficult to make a specific diagnosis when dealing with salivary masses. Thus, these almost always require tissue sampling. In some instances, this tissue sampling may be performed as a fine needle aspiration, and in some instances, this tissue sampling will be an excisional biopsy with or without a neck dissection. The difference between those two pathways really depends on the preference of the surgeon and institutional preferences. They're both reasonable paths for the patient.